Today's episode of Socially Democratic is now available on Patreon. Join our community on Patreon for free or for as little as $2.50 a month and you can help support the show so we can do more things like live shows and connect with fellow listeners across our social democratic community. When you sign up as a campaign organizer, you get a haters, hate and the rest vote labor merch uh, and access to our premium episodes and a free ticket to one of our upcoming live shows. So join these wonderful comrades and click on the Patreon link in the show's bio. Today's episode is also brought to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a campaign agency that specializes in community organizing. We only work with people that want to build power to make the world a better place, including community-based organizations, trade unions, progressive businesses, and social democratic parties across the globe. Uh, and if you want to create change in your community in 2024, then hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. As Australia's number one plan of law firm, Morris Blackburn believe the law should serve everyone and not just those who can afford it. Uh, they've helped influence some of Australia's most important legal decisions, including equal pay for women and Indigenous workers, and helped over 500,000 Australians get the compensation they deserve. Morris Blackburn Lawyers, experience you can count on. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left Organizing a podcast, uh, organizing a politics podcast that drops every Friday, that dives into the campaigns of the day and people leading them from home and abroad. This week, obviously, it's our Feeney Files. We have a chat with David Feeney uh, about all the things that have happened in the last month. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And when you're done listening to the show, give us five stars and leave us po- positive reviews. And for everything else, follow Dunn Street on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. All right, let's get to today's episode. We are taping this one on a Wednesday evening on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and it is the end of the month, and that means it is time for the Feeney Files, and joining me from some remote remote location in far western Queensland, by the sounds of it, and that decor suggests the case. David Feeney, welcome back to Social Democratic. How are you, mate? I'm well, always a pleasure, and yes, greetings from Queensland. We have a bit to get through. Uh, a fair bit's happened in politics in the last month. Um, I think we might bounce around a bit today. We might start with NT politics. We had an election uh, last Saturday, not a great result for the Labor Party. And then we might jump over to the United States and have a bit of a uh, pep talk about the DNC, the national, the Democratic National Convention happened in Chicago and then maybe come home and do a bit of, bit of federal politics. And we've also got a, uh, a listener question this week as well. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. Northern Territory politics. The NT went to an election on Saturday night. Labor was uh, seeking to be returned for a third term after first getting elected back in 2016. Uh, the party's gone through um, after having Michael Gunner elected as the chief minister in 2016 and then re-elected in 2020. Um, the party sort of moved through a couple of leaders after Michael resigned from politics um, and were looking to, uh, well, I mean, we did an episode with uh, a good comrade of ours, Ryan Neeb, a couple of weeks ago. And I must admit, after that episode, I kind of walked away thinking, ah, we might be a chance here. Um, but that wasn't the case as the votes came in and transpired. Labor lost eight seats. The Cultural Liberal Party picked up nine. Uh, 13 is the magic number to form government in uh, in the territory. So the Country Liberal Party with a swing of 17.8% to its primary, uh, won 16 seats. Labor's been reduced to four with a 10.8% swing against it. Uh, in fact, the Country Liberal Party got 49.1% of the uh, overall vote. Uh, the Greens had a swing of three and a half percent, still haven't picked up a seat yet, uh, and others are on three. Not a great night for uh, for Labor. Uh, just going to get your initial reflections, David. Well, obviously, uh, Labor got a shellacking, um, and so there's no good news in that. I, I mean, one of the distinctive features of the Northern Territory Um, perhaps more than anywhere else in Australia, is that each seat is so small that it becomes quite an individual contest. You know, if you annoy the family around the corner, there's a 2% swing right there. Um, That has often meant that good local members could dig in, but it didn't help Labor on this occasion. 
So um, I think you've got to be, you know, fair's fair. Tribute to the Liberal leader. She was quite the stayer after being one of the only survivors um, of the 2016 Labor victory. She has stuck it out and now yeah. led her party to victory. So, um, yeah, she's yeah, I'm, I, from a great distance and not a student of NT politics, but um, she's proven to be uh, resilient and ultimately very successful and hats off to that. Labor's now got the task of rebuilding. I guess my first thought after looking at the Northern Territory result was, what does this mean for federal labour in the Northern Territory? Um, with the federal position so closely um, contested, uh, we have two seats up there um, that we need to keep an eagle eye on. And um, both Lingiari and uh, Solomon, I think is the other one, um, we 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 need to be a little concerned about because I think there are two phenomena going on there um, that our local activists will have a bead on. The first is um, that Labor's once rock solid support amongst uh, First Australians is now strongly contested, um, and uh, and that's a factor that is new, comparatively new for Labor. And the second issue is that. Um, I think the law and order issue, together with cost of living issues, um, has meant that um, our support in uh, the, uh, the the broader community is also weakened. So there are kind of there's a pincer movement um, going on up there that that is I think of federal concern as well as of local concern. Um, you know, so man the barricades in Lingiari and Solomon. Uh, just talking to some folks from the campaign. Uh, after the result, some of their reflections um, that is um, sort of worth being shared. I appreciate that they've even said this might have a bit of Monday quarterbacking going on, but I mean, they thought that it was a lot worse than what everyone had predicted. Uh, yes. Some folks had said who were connected with the field program uh, that in that final week, than a great experience, um, and clearly there was a lot of anger. Uh, on the doorsteps from voters. So that's a concern. I, going into Saturday, I was like, oh, that's not great. Um, and uh, also they'd sort of felt that uh, perhaps the electorate already switched off after they changed leaders a couple of times. And you know, no, no matter what they'd done in the campaign proper, they probably weren't going to shift any votes. There was some a little bit of internal criticism about had our actual candidates been doing enough work, had they got a little bit kind of comfortable in their jobs and not done the work that, you know, certainly Ryan uh, Neavitt spoke about on that episode that if, you know, you will get exposed as a candidate in the Northern Territory if you are not knocking on doors and talking to voters to the point you made before, David, you know, you pick a fight with your next door neighbour and you lose 10%. So, um, you know, there was a bit there was a bit of criticism there as well. Um, however, well, uh, there was obviously no reason for any Labor MP in the Territory to be sitting on their laurels because I mean, Labor's best case scenario here was that it was going to be a tight election. Hmm. Yeah, um, and in the end, it wasn't. It wasn't even that, was it? No, I mean the bush still seemed to have held. I mean, those three sort of groups that Ryan talked about. Uh, you know, the urban areas, the bush, and the regions. The bush still was good for Labor, uh, and the progressive totals votes in the inner city of Darwin and the coastal seats outweighed the coast the conservative vote, and that is an implication for the seat of Solomon, because that uh -huh. does take in. Uh, the seats within uh, Darwin, the city, and in that satellite town of Palmerston. Yes. Um, so well, Palmerston's often been tough for Labor. Oh, incredibly tough. Um, but broadly speaking, um, you know the 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 centre or the sorry the left wing vote outweighed the right wing vote in Darwin, but it just didn't. It wasn't. They just weren't voting the Labor Party. So they, there is work to be done there. They have to make sure they bring those folks back for the next federal uh, election. Um, but also saying the non-major party votes in the electorate have shown it's not loyal to any side. So, you know, the country like Liberal Party, if they don't start to fix the things that they promised, then they're going to find themselves in a bit of trouble in four years' time. Um, and the dysfunction of Northern Territory politics is always interesting. I, I got a sense from election night, I don't know if you saw the, um, the, the speech that wasn't delivered by the leader of the liberal country liberal party but the speech beforehand that by the president who basically did the acceptance speech 
and kind of said the boys are back in control now. The old old boys club's back in control, and basically did the speech that the leader was supposed to deliver. And then she gets up and has to do a speech, but being overshadowed by this guy, this president, who just kind of took it upon himself to speak for twenty minutes about how he won the campaign. So there's clearly, you know, if you put your Labor Party hat on, he said, if you did that, you'd be like, I am going to kill you after this, you know. So they're probably yeah. fighting, you know. Yeah, but she's uh, she's the uh, chief minister, and in the coalition, chief ministers have more prerogatives than Labor leaders do. Um, so I know who my money's on in winning that tussle for power. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it'll be her. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll have to watch this one. But your points about Solomon are certainly um, something that the party should be concerned uh, about. Should we go over to the United States well, let because what a wonderful story it is. I um, I, I I'm sure like you, I have um, watched the um, DNC uh, the the in Chicago, um, and what an extraordinary um, week of politics it was. At, you know, the US. I'm I'm currently uh, uh, at a conference which is populated by a number of Americans, and you know we just talk about American politics like it's. Um, a roller coaster ride, and you just don't know what's around the corner. But I thought, yeah, bottom line, a flawless week for the Democrats and a flawless week for Kamala Harris. And when I say flawless, I mean, you know, flawless. Mm. I, I, you'll remember some of my anxieties about her candidacy going forward were a question around her legitimacy. Uh, and uh, because she hadn't gone through a primary process, because she hadn't been elected into the position, um, and then question marks about some of her policy settings. Well, I mean, those concerns were just swept away. We we joked about how, you know, the US Democrats aren't like the Labor Party. They won't just cop a decision from the national executive. Well, it turns out they will. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and so, you know, she was greeted with, uh, I mean, who knows what blood was spilt in the back rooms, but as far as, um, you know, the rest of us are concerned, a united party um, a, a carefully reshaping the narrative around their presidential candidate, um, moving her into the centre, whether the, everyone likes it or not. Um, a, a, her vice presidential pick, um, who is really from the left of the party, um, was positioned just so elegantly um, mm. as, you know, the coach, uh, the, the guy from a rural small town speaking to, in particular, middle America, white America, um, beautiful. And then the oratory. I, I, I don't know if you um, treated yourself to some of the speeches, but... Um, you know, Obama, the Obamas, um, both Barack and Michelle, um, uh, Pete Buttigieg, who's one of my favourites, um, outstanding oratory. And just you, you can't help but think at the end of that week, what a remarkable resurgence. You know, this party has gone from being D-E-A-D mm -hmm. um, uh, to, uh, you know, and of course, you know, Joe Biden was honoured beatified the president who handed over power so that you know democracy would survive you know uh, 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 given the the credit that he frankly deserves um for making that decision which has brought the democrats back into center stage and at this moment i think we can say that um the the, the landscape has changed i was looking at something today where um, the Democrats have gone from being considered 44% likely to win the election to 55% likely to win the election. And that is just the re-energisation of, of the Democratic base. So just incredible. And the kind of, the, the quality of the oratory, the choreography, the strategic thinking, you've got to think, gee, they, if these guys can hold that together for another 74 days or so, um, this is going to turn into a win. And conversely, Donald doesn't seem, you know, I mean, we've been range finding on Donald Trump for, since 2016. Um, you know, we know what we're dealing with. Mm. Um, he is not, he does not know what he's dealing with. He has not successfully range, range done any range finding on, on Kamala Harris. And so Vice President Harris is still something he hasn't properly grasped. Um, and I guess let me finish my monologue by saying um, all eyes on the next debate.
Yeah, of which there was a report this morning that he's trying to back out of now. Oh, I, I, well, I'm not surprised. Uh, it, it was, uh, I think, it, I thought it was scheduled on ABC yeah. um, and very difficult for him to back out of it because, of course, he made quite the hoo-ha about debating her anywhere, any time. Um, I guess he'll need to quietly dispose of a lot of T-shirts if he backs out of this. It was uh, just to summarise that excellent um, opening stanza. It was it was a fant- it was an absolute success. Um, and my takeaways, of which there are many, and I'll just try and clip them. Um, first of all, uh, it really puts the Victorian ALP state conference into light, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, Mooney Valley just doesn't have what the United Centre in Chicago can put on. I mean, I know it's pretty good, but wow. <laughs> Well, okay, to be fair, because, you know, I love our little tin pot democracy. Um, <laughs> the US, yeah, the DNC is not about debate. It's not about uh, making decisions about the platform. It's not a mechanism of any, you know, of, of, of any virtue in terms of providing input into the leadership of the party. It's where a lot of people get to sit for hours and listen to speeches. Mm. Um, and the reason it works is because the speeches are so bloody good that they do sit there for hours and listen to them. Um, or, you know, even, you know, in Melbourne, you watch them on YouTube. Um, uh, of course, our conferences, tragically different as they are, are debates. Yeah. Um, I was listening to some people discuss this with respect to the British Labor Party, or in fact, the British Conservative Party. Um, and of course, you know, they're not the same um, in terms of the quality of the oratory, the quality of the choreography, but, you know, they are places where you can watch two MPs having an argument mm. and you'll never see that at a DNC. No. To the point you said before about the speeches, it just constantly, I'm constantly re-reminded how much I, and I'm biased obviously because public narrative is a part of the practice that I do in terms of organising but how central the story of self, the story of us, the story of now is th- th- that narrative is the is the driving element within the speeches, uh, the keynote addresses at the Democratic National Convention. The, it, you would be struggling to find uh, any of the folks that are getting up really going into sp- particular policy detail like if you're a policy writer you'd be crying because you're like all oh, my hard work is yeah. not getting getting a run here but it's all about stories it's and it's not just because i think we might no the it's point. values it's virtue signaling and values it, it and it but it's and it's shown in moments not in so you, the, i think sometimes we think i've heard people in australia refer to like your log cabin story and it just burns my piss want to hear that it's not a log cabin story it's take me to the moments where you learned these values the obamas do it so well tim walls did it so well um even hillary who's been historically bad at this sort of stuff finally somehow managed to work this stuff out she gave a great speech um so that the, i was just i just constantly was watching and just loving every minute of it and i was having organizers from around australia text me saying oh did you see that speech by that person or did you see there's that you know but the whole yeah. week was that the whole week was that and it was just it's fantastic true. and it wasn't that long ago we were looking grief stricken at the democrats and saying how can it be that we haven't got somebody else to offer for the presidency and what this week showed, and it's quite reassuring, is that in fact the Democratic Party has got loads of talent. Yeah, uh, there's, I mean, there was lots of A-grade material strutting their stuff on that stage, um, and that's excellent. I and I'm not sure if Gretchen Whitmer, the governor, the incredibly successful governor of um, Michigan, which is an incredibly important state in the uh, in the pathway to 270. I'm not sure if she had a formal speaking role in the in the convention, and if she did, I missed it. But I saw her do an interview on MSNBC that in the morning they were just grabbing folks and doing sort of, you know, packaging or um, debriefing the night before. She just continues to amaze me. And I know I've already talked up on the show before, but I just absolutely love Gretchen Whitman. Like I watched her and listened to her. She's middle America. She's down to earth. She's uh, she knows how to deliver a line. She's 
uh, she's uh, she's incredibly articulate. She's switched on. She's very much in touch with you know the the, the center of American voters. And I was like, you know, if we get eight years out of Harris, you know, you're got to be next because you're a phenomenal. Like she's just waiting in the wings. Like it's the, the bench for the Democrats is deep. And, yeah, and it's right. a young, it's a younger generation as well. I don't know how Gretchen Whitman, how old she is, but she couldn't be, she'd be late. No, 40s. but you're kind of moving from the 80 year olds back down to the sort of 40s and yeah. 50s, don't you? Yeah. 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 It's fantastic. And the other thing I did love about it was, um, <laughs> I don't know what coverage you're watching, but I was watching it on MSNBC. And I know that we're very critical of Australian media, but I had to laugh because MSNBC basically is Democrat TV for the week. So they're basically in the studio. <laughs> and when they throw to the next speech or they come back from that speech and they do their kind of quick sort of debrief, it's like, wasn't that amazing? Oh, the way that, you know, Michelle just <laughs> articulated this or that, or how she just drove a stake into the heart no, of Donald Trump. It's guy at night for Democrats, isn't it? Oh, it was just... Like they, have, they, have a, they have stopped pretending. Yeah. Like Rachel Maddow was literally just beside herself oh. throughout the whole week. It was just great. I loved it. Like it's so partisan. I don't know. She goes great. too. Oh, she all goes too far. Like I, they can't keep calling themselves journalists. Anyway, they do. No, um, no, they, no, they cannot. Um, but uh, you know, I say more of that. Wouldn't you love? I mean, that's kind of basically what this podcast is, except... Well, you know, isn't that always been our complaint in Australia? Like, we've got, you know, the, the you know, two-thirds of the media ravening for the right and one-third of the media ravening for the Greens. No one's ever been on our side. No. Um, the, in the United States, you know, they've got... It's half and half. It seems quite fair. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, My other takeaway is uh, that I wanted to maybe get your reflection on is... Uh, the central message throughout the whole week, uh, a new way forward, uh, freedom and how you manifest the idea of freedom, uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, hope, not fear. Yeah, hope coming back into it. I loved when it uh, was it Michelle We're not Obama, going back. Yeah. Inter like setting themselves up basically now to just that's what they're going to run. That's the contrast they're creating. I just want to get your reflections yeah. on that. Well, I mean, the first thing is just to appreciate, you know, as you know, professionals, the sheer presumption of their strategy, which is that um, Vice President Harris is going to be the change candidate. <laughs> well, that was my second question, David. Yeah, like, is she? The, is this a change election? Is she a change candidate? Because they're kind of creating She's that without saying candidate. that, right? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, well, I think, I think. I think they've done it. I mean, it, it's now out there for um, Trump to disrupt, but they've done it. He's the 78-year-old billionaire who wants to take America back, um, and he has not been able to shake off that frame um, and really hasn't applied himself to trying to shake off that frame. Um, but she, with iron discipline, Vice President Harris and her team, um, change candidate, hope not fear, um, future united America governing for everybody. Um, you know, there's a place for every American. Really, uh, just ignoring some of the you know big challenges that were um, and will remain, I guess, difficult for the Democrats. You know, the fact that she was the czar of uh, immigration is vanished. Um, the fact that immigration is the issue that it is in the United States has just been overrun and apparently forgotten. Um, you know, I mean, voters will return to it. Don't worry about that. But it hasn't framed the Democrats. Um, and and the Democrats are engaging in an economic debate, um, you know, contesting this idea that things were better when Trump was president. I mean, as I said at the start, flawless. It was a flawless week. Um, they, weren't, they weren't defending um, Vice President Harris's record. They were inventing a new one. And, um, and they did. And it's amazing. Um, if you're the campaign manager, th th there's starting to be grumblings, even from media like the New York Times and the Washington Post, I that Harris has yet to hold a oh, press conference yeah. or give an yeah. interview. The yeah. argument that she needs to be tested on a number of these policy issues and put to bed some of the best yeah. attacks that of her candidacy that, you know, is she a liberal? Is she a moderate? Where does she sit on a whole bunch of these things? 
Now you're yeah. running the campaign right now. She is controlling the narrative. Why would you give that up yeah. and expose yourself? I just want to get your thoughts on that. What do you do if you're the campaign manager? Oh, well, it's so rude, but why would you? Why would you? Um, I mean, it, 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 she, she's under no real pressure to do it, frankly. Um, and she can, I mean, she's been able to bat, she's now taken to answering one or two questions as she gets off a plane, and that's her idea of engaging with the media. <laughs> waves, waves to everyone else. <laughs> Vice yeah. President Harris, Vice President Harris, yes, I'll take your question. Oh, sorry, I'm not. Um, yes, but she's getting away with that. Um, obviously, it, it brings into sharp relief the um, fact that the media are just so ancillary now to elections because no matter what she says in such an interview, you know now, you and I know right now how Fox are going to spin it hmm. and how, you know, CNN are going to spin it. Like we, we, we know that now before a word has been uttered. Um, it's it, it's made the media pointless, um, and 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 the campaign director I think would be able to say, well, maybe this will have to, maybe the moment will come where we have to sit down and do an in depth interview, but we don't have to yet, because um, we have a lot of momentum and we've shaped the story and we've reframed the national debate. And why are we going to give anybody the opportunity to fuck that up? The other thing I want to sort of get your thoughts on or anyway just sort of sort of raise it with folks um is the polling and we haven't there's not we haven't seen any major polls come out since the since the convention week and obviously she will get a bump but as it stands now from the moment that uh she took over the the nomination for the democratic party there's been a seven point swing from trump to harris trump led by in the Battleground states, the key battleground states, by an average of five points. Now Harris leads by two. Um, in the national polling averages, it's a 49 to 46 lead by Harris. But if you sort of then start to look a lot closer, Michigan, she has a two-point lead over Trump. Pennsylvania, it's a tie at 48. Georgia, Trump has a four-point lead. Uh, in Wisconsin, Harris has a two-point lead. And in Arizona, it's a virtual tie as well. Going back to, I've read a whole bunch of articles from a bunch of different pollsters talking, reviewing about how polling had gone basically over the last three or four cycles and where they'd got it wrong and how they tried to fix the correct or correct make the corrections on the mistakes they made previously. Um, in 2020, even though Biden won, they overestimated Biden by about four points. So he had like a six point national lead. Uh, he had a five-point lead in Pennsylvania going into election day and only won by one and a half, two points. And so if you're looking at yeah. this right now, she if if they make if the pollsters make the same mistakes as they did the last time, in that they're not getting enough um Trump voters in their sample, she she is gonna need a bigger lead than what she's currently got right now. I just want to get your thoughts on on the polls. Yeah, well, I mean, for, let me repeat what Barack Obama said at the the DNC, you know, this is still going to be a close con contest. And after the remarkable renovation and rejuvenation of the Democratic cause, that doesn't give the Democrats victory. That just puts them back in the hunt. Um, I, you make two good points. I, the first is that um, the, the the polls are very close. I mean, the polls I've seen, um, and you're right, it's always very hard because each state is different, but the polls I've seen are very, very promising for the Democrats, but they're all still within the margin of error. Mm. And uh, the second point you make is that, you know, there's this factor of uh, Trump. It's not that they're not reaching enough Trump voters necessarily. It's that Trump voters don't reveal they are Trump voters. And this is the idea that, you know, Trump is uh, debating outside the Overton window, outside, you know, he says things that are outside pleasant conversation or acceptable limits and he, and that does attract supporters but attracts supporters who won't admit to being supporters um and you know i guess if you happen to think that there are lizards under the city who are controlling um the society from their tunnels you might not want to admit to a pollster what your views are either so there is there is this factor of course it's an it's a known unknown three percent seems to be the number that usually gets cited for it um, what does all that mean? Who knows? It's going to be bloody close. Yeah. Um, but what a transformation that is 
from you know that moment where Biden and Trump walked out onto the debate stage together and our world caved in. <laughs> Yeah, and, anyway. You know, hey, and finally, a shout out to Nancy Pelosi, um, who I think gets the lion's share of credit for transforming the Democratic Party in the last few weeks. Um, what a lioness of the movement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, unbelievable. Oh, one other thing I want to ask you Bill Clinton's speech, did you catch any of that? I didn't actually know. He said something during the speech, which I thought of you immediately. He said, he warned everyone at the conference, at the convention, don't become the party of cultural condens- uh, uh, condensation. Uh, condensation. Condensation, yeah. yeah. And I was like, yeah, hmm. don't be condescending. Don't, this is, well, of course, his wife is the exemplar of this problem, right? The deplorables. Well, that, they learned yes, this lesson. That's exactly right. Everyone was like, oh, interesting, Bill. Uh, <laughs> who are you having a crack at there? Um, anyway, good point, will- though. Yeah, we'll continue to watch this space because uh, in the next, I'm sure that, you know, who knows what the end of uh, September will look like when we catch up again uh, <laughs> to t- touch on US politics. Uh, let's come home and talk about uh, federal politics. Uh, there's a lot happening. Um, we've, there always is, yes. Yeah, there was uh, yesterday across all of our major capital cities, certainly in Melbourne, one of the biggest, biggest union marches I've ever seen um in our city's history uh cfmu uh workers and built workers across the building industry basically went out and marched and i was in the city coming back from a workshop and they were just the march was just turning turning the corner from russell street to head up to uh, burke street up to parliament and it extended all the way back as far as it looked like as far as the eight hour monument the 888 monument that's five four blocks i mean that was huge um so that's happening um, Bill Shorten's having a crack at the RBA. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things going on. Uh, just want to get your overview first, David, about what you are seeing in the last month of federal politics, and then we can maybe dive into some of the specifics. Yeah, well, you'll remember last time we had this chat, uh, I talked about how I thought Labor was being buffeted by externalities and was all too often appearing to be a commentator uh, on, on federal politics rather than sort of the leader and the driver. Um, and I don't think um, anything's happened in the last little while to change that fundamental truth. So, you know, to take the CFMEU issue, for example, um, you know, it was a success for the Albanese government that um, they were able to finally get through Parliament the legislation they needed to do the things they want to do with the CFMEU. But that legislative success um, doesn't translate into momentum or additional support for Labor, um, perhaps even the reverse, because fundamentally for a lot of people, Labor cleaning up a union is a Labor cleaning up its own mess. But then sort of to make that even more difficult and complicated, you know, the CFMU, or at least sort of parts of the CFMU, have sworn vengeance upon the Labor Party and um, and its leadership. And, uh, and I guess part of that is, uh, them, you know, the Greens opposed um, the legislation to intervene in the CFMU in the Parliament, and now they've appeared at the CFMU rallies um, speaking to... I mean, so what the, the Greens are engaged in is, you know, a cynical exercise to build support amongst those who are angry and disaffected, constantly in the market for new constituencies. Um, and Labor's of course, doing what a government must do when confronted with these kinds of allegations. I, I, we'll see how the story ends, um, but I, I, one of my concerns, and this goes to again to a conversation you and I have already had, is appointing an administrator to the CFMEU, two, two thoughts, nothing more than that, two thoughts. The first thought is, okay, well, an administrator in the CFMEU isn't somebody necessarily empowered to look at the webs of corruption that exists between the CFMU and other institutions, whether they be building companies or whatever. Um, so is this just another um, attack on part of the problem, not the whole problem? Mm. And my second thought was, um, unless this person has the skills of Elliot Ness and the martial arts skills of um, 
you know, Brandon Lee or somebody. Um, how is a new administrator going to affect the kind of change or the kind of investigations that this job requires? Mm. Um, because it's not just about administering a union, is it? It's about conducting a whole lot of detailed investigations. So um, two thoughts. I worry about whether there's actually at the end of the rainbow going to be anything of consequence happen here. Um, and in the meantime, political pain for Labor. And, you know, people are saying, I'm obviously a long way from Melbourne this week, but I heard uh, people suggest that there are up to 50,000 people marching in Melbourne, uh, which is a lot of people. Yeah, it is a lot of people. Um, and with that, that union and allied unions in that industry have threatened or suggested that campaign donations might be coming their way in the lead up to the next federal election and sub sizable campaign donations that would really impact the party's ability. Um, and that would have to be a concern as well. And I look, I get that the part the government is trying to do, you know, the it is what it is. You just can't factor thing. that stuff in. No, no, but it doesn't help. Like if from a political perspective, not getting that money and having 50,000 people out on the streets against you, not a great way to prepare yourself for an election campaign in less than six months' time. Sure, but, you know, there's a million dollars of bad press in, in hanging tough with them, isn't there? It just, I just sometimes think that the responses from a federal government standpoint is always very processy. How is it that Daniel Andrews can see a conflict? or a crisis and run at it and then come out looking amazing and everyone else looking terrible, but the federal government see a crisis and then come out looking like shit. Well, this is an old labor problem. We, we, we're, 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 we're problem solvers. We're programmatic problem solvers. We see a problem and we design a program or a policy to fix the problem. And what doesn't happen in that process is, you know, the, the shock, the outrage, the virtue signalling, the rallies, the messaging, um, you know, all of the pantomime of politics that is so necessary these days. You know, we've, 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 just, we've just rushed on stage with the solution or what at least I hope is the solution. Mm. What else has got your attention in uh, federal politics? Well, you know, the NDIS reforms in some respects are a similar story, aren't they? So, again, this is a story where... Um, you know, difficult decisions are being made by Labor. Labor successfully, uh, and, and Bill Shorten successfully, gets a set of reforms negotiated through the federal parliament with the support of the opposition and through the state leaders. You know, by any definition, a feat. Um, and this changes the growth profile of the um, National Disability Insurance Scheme from 12% per annum to 8% per annum. So it's still growing bloody fast um, and probably still unsustainable. But anyway, um, uh, and 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 so how is this important reform greeted, a reform that makes the scheme sustainable, preserves the federal budget? Well, it's greeted with um, you know very little interest, really, from the political media and... The Greens have been busy going out there and making sure that they are opposing the reforms and then um, campaigning alongside those advocacy groups who are concerned about the rivers of gold coming to an end. So um, a, an important policy success for Labor, which, it's, which, you know, on the best analysis has a muted response or on the worst analysis is just another opportunity for the Greens to swoop in like the, um, you know, vultures that they are and try and pick up some disaffected progressives. What could Labor have done then to mitigate against that, though, do you think, from a, like a stakeholder standpoint, perhaps? Yeah, I, I, nothing, I suspect. Um, you know, if you're if you're an advocacy group for a scheme that's growing at 12% a year, um, then you know, you, things are pretty good and you're not going to be in the change business. Yeah. Um, I, I think we would, you know, I, I think the success is that Bill got the changes at all. Um, given the requirement to win support from the opposition and um, op and state leaders. But, you know, all of those people, to one degree or another, recognise the fact that the scheme was growing at an unsustainable rate. And if they didn't help fix it, it would inevitably become their problem too. Um, and, you know, the, the Greens don't share that mindset, do they? And, and that's not new and that's not a surprise. But I guess my point is... Um, 
again, a, a big success for Labor doesn't translate, though, does it, into momentum or support. I want to get your reflection speaking on Bill Shorten. And I asked this of Amit Singh on our episode last week um, when we were mostly talking about sort of economics from a policy standpoint, but I want to get your political analysis of this. Bill Shorten's remarks that was critical of the Reserve Bank um, and their policy to try and address uh, inflation and sort of cooling the economy. And I'll quote what Bill said for you, uh, David, and then I'll get your thoughts. Um, The RBA is independent, but that doesn't mean that they're immune from being disagreed with. Uh, He said, noting that the central bank had fumbled its inflation and interest rate forecast after the pandemic. He said, I don't believe the economy is running hot for most Australians. He goes on to say, there are some Australians who are doing very well, but for most Australians, we're seeing their savings being reduced. We're seeing their cost of living, we're seeing cost of living pressures. The way to deal with it though, isn't to push this nation into recession with higher and higher interest rates. (laughs) Oh, uh, Bill. God bless him. Well, you know, there are there are lots of important people in the Labor Party who think it's the job of the Labor Party to secure power and then give that power to unelected advisory groups and consultative groups, usually populated by ex-judges, former senior public servants um, and activist organisations, um, and that that then is a virtuous and progressive reform because Labor has given the decision to somebody else. Um, and I don't subscribe to that philosophy. I like to think that Labor uses its power to actually um, app- appoint the people it needs and enact the policies it needs. And Bill is also one of those people. So he doesn't think <laughs> that the greatest contribution the Labor Party can do to a decision is walk away and give it to um, you know a, a panel of um, uh, esteemed uh, retired judges from Scotch grammar. Um, so that's a very long-winded way of me saying, um, you know, the RBA is these the RBA and institutions like it are created by those elected by the people to serve a function, and we are allowed to criticise them. And when they believe themselves to be above the will of the people um, and above the will of the parliament, we dispense with their services. Um, And, yes, we are allowed to criticise these organisations, even though the esteemed Reserve Bank of Australia, because at the end of the day, the Reserve Bank of Australia is populated by a group of people who are making judgments about the economy. And given how often in recent times those judgments have been wrong, mm-hmm. they have we don't need to regard them as an oracle. In fact, we can be quite confident they're not an oracle um, and we're allowed to criticise them. It's uh, I, 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 it's the first time I've, I've felt like in certainly the last couple of months we've seen a bit of fight coming out of the government. On particularly on that issue, and obviously it's a hot button issue because it's probably going to be the issue that will dominate the election in um, in May or whenever the hell it's going to be. Um, I, I don't. I wonder. Is... Yeah, no, I, I don't. I mean, I think what you're forgetting is that um, you know, the biggest issue. For, you know, I mean, we talked last week about Senator Payman and how she and her um, posturings had stolen two weeks from federal labour. Well, it does seem that in the period since then, federal Labor decided to decisively respond by changing the subject to Palestinian refugees coming into Australia, didn't they? So, well, didn't Dutton do that? Well, it, well, I think you'd have to say that um, the Labor government has helped. Well, I, I mean, first of all, if, to sort of go back to the start of that train wreck, a big shout out to Mike Burgess, um, Australia's uh, chief spy. Um, you know, people might remember that in March of this year, um, he came out of the shadows and announced that a former Austra- a former or current MP was a spy and part of a foreign spy ring, but he couldn't tell you who it was. Um, and so that left us all playing, you know, guess a spy for the next few months. Thank you, Mike Burgess. Mike obviously retreated into his cave and thought, gee, that was fun. Mm-hmm. But I can, I you know, I, there's more mayhem for me to create there. So he crept out from the cave and went on insiders of all things. Um, so we've gone from chief spies in Australia remaining invisible to them becoming, I mean, he'll be on TikTok next. Um, <laughs> and, and there he made the very helpful comment um, that uh, Palestinians 
coming to Australia who have expressed rhetorical support for the listed terrorist group Hamas um, need not be a problem um, in coming into Australia. Well, well, thanks very much, Mike. That's very helpful. And you know, then, of course, the debate was on, wasn't it? Mm. Um, and Peter Dutton and others were asking the question of um, uh, the Labor Party, well, gee, is, is it OK um, to be a supporter of Hamas and come to Australia on a tourist visa and apply for asylum? And we've watched a cavalcade of Labor MPs ask this question over the last two weeks and move heaven and earth to avoid answering it. Um, and and I just, it, it what, what an own goal. Um, thank you, Mike Burgess. Um, and uh, what an embarrassment for the Labor Party. I mean, if, of course... We had hundreds of supporters of the Ku Klux Klan coming to Australia and we said, well, their support for the Ku Klux Klan is merely rhetorical. They're not actually going to do anything. They're just, they're just fans of the Klan. Uh, I think people would say, well, that's still a problem um, in terms of what they're going to be like in this country and what they're going to do for social cohesion. I'm not sure more Klan members in Australia is going to be good. Um, and so, of course, that's what happened. People said, well, hang on a minute. Well, you know, we've got lots of questions of detail about these Hamas supporters. Um, and Labor just found itself tied up in knots, um, you know, it, it tied up in knots about the visa. Um, what, is it a tourist visa? Why didn't they create a special humanitarian visa? Um, how many are coming in? Who's vetting them? The Prime Minister misspoke in the parliament about the role that ASIO plays in vetting them. Um, you know, and, and suddenly our body politic was paralysed once again by the immigration debate and the um, Gaza war coming hand in hand to steal oxygen and life from the Australian body politic. And I just thought to myself, I was watching um, the immigration minister, Tony Burke, the member for Watson, speaking on on this in the parliament and he was he's a very good parliamentary performer and he was here again and the commentators were all congratulating him and i thought no this is a disaster we, we did we it doesn't matter how eloquently we talk about how we're bringing hamas supporters to australian suburbs it's not a big vote winner it's not a great idea we are going to get criticized for it and sure enough um, that's what happened and i just thought how remarkable it was that in the aftermath of Senator Payman, this was the hill we decided to die on. I mean, is this a political strategy which says, well, you know, we've got problems all over Australia, but Blacksland and Watson are going to be okay? Uh, what are we doing? I, I The thing I find interesting is how we, to the phrase you just used before, we got ourselves twisted in knots, is how we continue to want to engage on topics that we probably, if we had a choice, we wouldn't want to engage on it. And I think the successes of other Labor governments around the country, particularly in state governments, and I know people always say our oh, state politics are different to federal, but it basically is the same in, in terms of how you're going to, you know, strategize. Is that we constantly at a federal level want to get drawn into this stuff and debate it, whereas I would, you know, use the levers of power to set the narrative about what you want to talk about as opposed to what the media want to talk about. We always seem to want to feed the beast about the things, either what the opposition are going to throw at us or what the media are going to throw at us. And one of the things that I've always yeah. admired about Daniel Andrews' leadership was whenever you got a question from a journalist, which had been put to that journalist probably by someone in the Liberal Party, Daniel would always say, they're irrelevant to my plans for Victoria. He would never, ever, ever ne negotiate or answer a question yeah. on their terms. And then he well, would I mean pivot onto the things that he wants to talk about until the journalist got sick of it. And we just don't seem to have... The, the wisdom or the courage to do to do that and say, now, he, I'm going to tell you what we are going to talk about today, and whether you like it or not. Well, that's, I mean, there are challenges about doing that federally. The federal gallery is different. The scrutiny is different. David, but, I don't know, reckon, David, I disagree. But, no, no, before, well, you, hang, before sure. you finish that point, before you finish that point, I just want to give you an example. I just want to give you an example. During the federal campaign, the last federal campaign, there was a joint press conference with David, sorry, with um, Daniel Andrews and Anthony Albanese. And he was getting all the same, Daniel Andrews was getting the same questions that Albanese was getting. And it, it was an, it was a classic sort of A, B, T 
test to see how both politicians handled it. And it got to the point that Albo couldn't get a word in. You could see Albo overlooking over Daniel's shoulders trying to get back in again because Daniel, was he had the federal press pack under control and was running that press conference. And then when he threw it back to Albo, it went back to sort of how Albo does it. And it got out of control again. And in that moment there, because I'd always thought that view as well, when people said, oh, you know, the federal press pack, they're a different beast to state rounds. Well, Daniel basically had them under control. In a, I can't remember what the topic was, but it was pretty, like it was a difficult one to negotiate. And it had layers in it about COVID and all that kind of stuff. Andrews killed them. He absolutely killed them. And they walked out of there going, I just don't know really what, what happened there. It's not, it's, they're not that smart. We've talked about how stupid these journalists are at a federal level. We just don't have the ability to actually say to them, no, I'm going to set the terms about how we're going to talk about this and negotiate this conversation. And I just don't see that from our federal team. That's well, there, a... I mean, there are certainly, I, I would I would bet London to a brick that Mike Burgess of ASIO would not have done insiders without first advising the Attorney General um, that, that he was going to do that. But I don't know. Obviously, I don't know that, but I would guess that's true. The Attorney General sort of said no. No, mate, you've you've you, you've Without gone on television. You have detonated on television once before, and we don't need you to do it again. Now they might have misjudged and thought that what he was going to do was deliver a message about how there can't be inflammatory commentary um, on these issues anymore, and position Labor to say, "Well, you know, we're we're virtuous, and the Greens and the Liberals are being toxic." But of course, it thing runs wildly off track, and instead, the conversations about. Hamas supporters coming to Australia. So you, there are some elementary things you can do, which is, for instance, don't let Mike Burgess go on television again. And I, I tell you what, if, if they let him do a third interview in 2024, um, they deserve you. everything they get. Yeah. So okay. I, I, I just thought, you know, the Labor Party bringing the immigration debate back to life um, and it was just a remarkable misstep. Just Let's, in case people were forgetting about it, we reminded them. We did. Uh, any other things you want to talk about in terms of federal politics before we go to our listener question? I look forward to having a far more optimistic report next time. <laughs> okay. Our question this week is from uh, John. And don't forget, if you want to send us questions for our Fanny Files uh, at the end of the month, uh, please uh, be a Patreon subscriber. You can go. There's links in the bio for this episode in your um in the you know the thing that you click on. Uh, <laughs> the for, thing that you click on. Yeah, the, yeah, like I you, don't know. You yeah. wordsmith, you. Yeah, exactly. In the bio for the podcast. Okay, I'm, okay, sure, okay. I'm assuming that, that everyone has that, and it doesn't matter what podcast app you use. I know the Apple Podcast app. You can see there's a link there you can click on, uh, and you can join our um, subscribe to Patreon. And, uh, and ask a question of David for the episode. This one's from John. And John says, I'm a lifelong Labor voter, but I can't handle how woke Victorian Labor is getting. Uh, example, Minister for Men's Behaviour. Uh, not even aware of that. Uh, one of the worst places in the world for parental rights for trans kids. Um, no money for paramedic strikes, but money for um, LGBT games. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things you listed, which I won't go through all of them. This Government has done some great things, he says, but why does this party of the working class have an impulse to do such Greens social policy? He says, I'm hanging by a thread here, not just not just on voting Vic Labor, but campaigning against them. Oy vey. what's going on there? John, come on. Uh, like David, I hate the woke. Um, we'll still vote federal Labor at this point. Well, thank God for that. Uh, that's, I don't know if that's a question. Uh, well, there's a bit of a question in there for you, David. I just want to get your thoughts on uh, the question there from John. Is it just me or can I hear this question ticking? <laughs> um, uh, uh, it, it, wow. Okay. Well, I mean, my own personal view is that um, one of the things the Greens Party does do for us in Australia, um, which is positive, is it does make the great majority of policy lunatics join it rather than end up in the Labor Party. And so spares us um, a lot of the madness that um, uh, cons has consumed progressive parties in other places and, and is a continuing threat for the Democratic Party. We talked, of course, in this episode about 
um, how magnificent the DNC was. And, and, and we saw a number of speakers there warn their party about drifting into some of these issues which are so um, uh, yeah, alienating for so many voters, alienating for so much of you know, the middle class, um, and and alienate the Labor Party or you know, the Democratic Party, whatever it might be, from people of religious faith. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is Australia is not at the centre of this problem. We we share this problem um, with 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 other progressive parties across the West. And we, I think we're a little better off than some of the others because the Greens um, take so many of these crazed folk. And we've seen some remarkable debates going going on inside the Greens. Um, where, uh, where we saw the Victorian president of the Greens forced to resign because she suggested that their party should have a conversation about um, trans people entering women's own. Just suggested the matter should be discussed. So this stuff gets, um, and it's often couched in sort of faculty lounge language. Um, which which penetrable for a lot of um, uh, folks who aren't uh, obsessed by it. So wh- what do I think? I think uh, the solution is uh, keep voting Labor, join the Labor Party, um, make your voice heard um, and make sure that Labor remains the party that is interested in class and interested in how uh, disadvantage is a function of socioeconomic um, privilege and doesn't get completely distracted as others have done by replacing the idea of class with ultimately then promoting um, you know policies that are in fact in my view um, racist or exclusionary. You know, Martin Luther King said um, it should be about the quality of your character, not the colour of your skin, and um, uh, that's my view too. So uh, a set of complex issues there to keep you busy, Stephen. There are. And uh, thank you, John, for uh, your question. And we obviously encourage all of our listeners to uh, send in their questions for David and appreciate uh, your reflections on that, uh, Mr. Feeney. Okay. We are at the end of another episode of the Feeney Files. Um, David Woo-hoo. Feeney, thank you, thank you so much for making the time. I know you've got a bit on your plate at the moment. You're up in Queensland doing Queensland things. So we appreciate you coming on the show. Look Pleasure. forward to talking talking to you in a month's time. Until then, be safe. You too. And we'll talk to you soon. Well, I know ASIO keeps us safe, Stephen. <laughs>Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.